I, you know, I hated to disappoint you with the lack of red trousers, so uh, we're, we're, we're getting on to this part of the course now, the red scarf. No, no, only kidding. It's not that difficult. Um, so I'd just like to, um, you might think, well, this is a bit of a sidetrack. You know, wh where's this charge conservation coming in? We've been studying the Maxwell equations all along, and uh, this is almost the first time we've mentioned it. So um, if you... Uh, so this is roughly where we've, uh, we've got up to, and um, we concentrated last time on the integral form of Faraday's law, and uh, of course you saw like massive, massive technological implications, and we're going to come back and study Far Faraday's law when we do the energy sort of um, overview at the end of term, and you can make, well, as Faraday's laws respond to the physics of generators and motors, of course it's very appropriate to study it as part of uh, the e energy topic that brings things together. Um, so uh, Maxwell was the, the first form, uh, wrote to Faraday's law down in, in differential form for the first time. And so we've reached the point, we've studied now the Maxwell equations to this point. And um, what Maxwell realised, and we're kind of going to be doing his calculation of sort of almost over three lectures. Um, he's actually now, Maxwell had two kinds of, of day. One where he woke up at 5.30 and he was basically like Superman. Other days he woke up at 9.30 and uh, was just ordinarily brilliant, if you see what I mean. And uh, anyway, uh, on October the 19th, 1861, he probably got up at about 4.30. And um, he, uh, <coughs> he realised, uh, having... Of course, it was a massive advance that he'd phrased like a century of, of discoveries in electricity and magnetism as four differential equations. Uh, and he realised that Ampere's law could not be correct. Now, to you and me, it's by no means obvious that this contravenes charge conservation, uh, but it does. And that's uh, going to be the theme of this lecture. So, the first idea is actually very, very simple indeed. So, I've stressed throughout that to, to get away from considering currents as just a current in a wire and to think of a current density, which is a much more general concept. And a current density, any distribution of charge moving in space, constitutes a current density. And that's illustrated in figure uh, 43 of the um, course handout. So... The idea here of figure 43, let's say, I mean, there it's drawn deliberately again in some kind of arbitrary shape. Let's imagine that we've got a bunch of charges. So, for example, this might be a charged tennis ball. And as soon as I move it across the room, well, quite clearly, the charge distribution in the room is changing as a function of time. You know, 10 seconds ago, there was a lot of charge there and none here. Now there's a lot of charge here and none there. And this motion of, the, uh, of this charged tennis ball constitutes a current in space. We've got a current density uh, in space. So, uh, again, uh, if you've got... All you've got to do is just imagine cutting a little, first of all, small area element, of, uh, of course, in strictly speaking, an infinitesimal area element, and you just consider the motion of the charged ball with charge density rho, and let's make it easy on ourselves, it's uniformly charged, this, the, the, this ball, and it's moving with some velocity v, well, then it's just almost dimensional analysis to say that the, if I multiply the charge density by the velocity, it's equivalent to the current density. Because if I, you, you imagine there's a little infinitesimal surface and this thing passes through it, well, a total amount, and, and then we construct some little box here, this distance will be V delta T. Of course, we'd have to take into account that we wanted the normal component going through the surface and we would simply get that rho times v is the current density. And again, I mentioned this right at the beginning of the course, that we get used to thinking in the kind of elementary electricity and magnetism of a, of, of a scalar current. Uh, and for a straight wire, we've got this very simple relationship, which I, I think I, I put this one up earlier in the course, um, that you've got uh, for a straight wire... Of course, you must have, again, 
uh, this very straightforward relationship that the magnitude of this current density in amps per square metre times the area is equal to the current. And that we get that very simple result because in a straight wire, the normal along the, the wire, in other words, to the surface element and the current are in the same direction. So we can just abstract this very simple uh, scalar quantity from it. So that's the, um, the first point to make, which is, say, a very easy one. You know, it is, don't get carried away with, you know, the joke about the red scarf and so on. There's nothing uh, extremely difficult about what we're going to do in the next couple of lectures. So any distribution... Hang on, is the, the board lights... Uh, let me... don't seem to be... Oh, OK. Is this OK for vision? Yeah. So any distribution of charges in motion constitutes a current density. And this very simple idea is illustrated in figure 43 of the course handout and by pretty elementary consideration of if this is moving at some velocity v, how much charge per square metre passes through any, any infinitesimal area, uh, we get this very simple relationship. Come on in, no problem, we're only just warming up, we're on the easy bit, that rho v is equal to j. And so let's make that equation 9-1. Uh, and again, maybe it's worth saying uh, for a straight wire, Incidentally, this, uh, this way of writing, uh, we'll come back to, uh, we won't use this for a while, but I'd like to pop this in now because when we do the relativity of electric and magnetic fields in lecture 26, I'll use this way of writing the current. So it's not particularly relevant today, but just for later um, reference, if you like, for a straight wire, we've got that I is equal to the magnitude of the current density times the area of the wire, which by this straightforward relationship is equal to rho v a. I so say that's almost something we could knock off uh, by dimensional analysis. There's no, nothing very deep uh, in that. But that's, uh, you know, it is very important to realise that any motion of charge, where if we change the charge density as a function of time, we get a current density. So now let's think, well, uh, what happens if I consider the current density uh, through any surface? And so this is now, of course, we've got to generalise. If we've got motion of charge in space considered as a current generally, what is the current through any surface. And again, this is the, exactly the kind of concept that you studied in EM1 and that we've used a lot already, but now we're applying the idea to the current density. We've already used Gauss's flux law for electric fields and said, well, it's the normal component of the electric field integrated over the surface is the flux of the electric field through the surface. Well, similarly, the current density is a vector quantity. So if I integrate its normal component over the surface, again, sorry, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, I've used DA in the course for the area element, and it's not the, quite the same on, the, uh, on your handouts. Maybe that's worth uh, correcting up. And, uh, and so the total current through any surface is just the surface integral of the current density. And again, this is a, uh, something that's very, very sort of straightforward compared with a lot of things that we've studied so far. So, um, <clears throat> again, let's just progress to this figure. So the current I through any surface is given by and we've already defined all these symbols, so I won't redefine them again, that the current I is equal to the surface integral of the current density over the area. So this, uh, again, is quite um, a straightforward, I think, concept, is that 
and, and again, this obviously makes sense. If I integrate the normal component of this vector in amps per square metre over the entire surface, then I must get the total current passing through the surface. But now we, let's come to, I think that's all very obvious. Let's imagine now that we have the current density out of a closed surface. So this, was, this, is, this is completely true. This is, this is true in general. But now let's imagine we've got the current density out of a closed surface. Sorry, and this one, again, is illustrated in figure 44 of the course handout. Um, and now we, we consider what happens if we have a closed surface and that's illustrated in figure uh, 45 here. So now, well, of course, this is just generally true, but we now come to charge conservation. Let's imagine, for example, we so say there's a modern example, we wouldn't have thought of it in, in Maxwell and Faraday's time, but we certainly, it applies. Let's say that this ball starts off completely uncharged, but it's shooting out alpha particles made of some radioactive material. Well, clearly, see, this is the generalisation of current density. These alpha particles flying out into space constitute a spherical current. So, it's, you know, they're just flying out in every direction. Well, we've got a spherical current, and then as the alpha particles fly out, if charge is conserved, the ball has got to be acquiring a greater and greater negative charge, if charge is conserved, which it is. So this is a um, very important point, is that if I integrate over a closed surface S, it's got to be equal to the rate of change of the charge enclosed with respect to time. And we've got, again, like with Faraday's law, it's very important here that we've got a negative sign. If this thing is shooting out alpha particles, the ball is getting more and more negatively charged not more positively charged. That would contravene charge conservation. Similarly, it could be made of something that's shooting out beta particles. Then we've got electrons flying out and the ball is becoming positively charged. So if charge is conserved, which we believe to be an absolute law of physics, we must have that the negative rate of change of the charge inside the surface S is equal to the total current passing out through. So. Uh, for a closed surface, S, we deduce from charge conservation that this surface integral of J dot n over the surface must be equal to minus d, and I'll write specifically emphasising that this is a charge enclosed, um, that we've got now, let's move these boards up so we can uh, use, uh, have the whole th calculation in, um, if you like, in a column. where Q enclosed is the charge enclosed by the surface S. And as far as we know, charge really is, in, is conserved in the universe. So... Um, this is a universal principle known as charge conservation. And uh, of course you've studied conservation laws a lot in mechanics. 
obviously important conservation laws, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum. These give us enormous handle in physics on solving problems because if we know that some quantity is conserved, it's sure as hell got to come out the same at the beginning and the end of the calculation. So it's again, it's building up um, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that if we integrate this current density vector over a closed surface, the charge inside the closed surface must be decreasing, hence the negative sign, with respect to time. But now again, we're going to write, just like in, in EM1, we looked at you know, charge enclosed by a surface. Of course, we can always, and, and, and in this course, I've said, well, we can replace that by a volume integral of the charge density inside. So it's straightforward to say, I don't think we even really need to justify this to any great extent, that Q enclosed can certainly be expressed as the volume integral of the charge density. And again, in a simple case, if I had this ball had you know, shot out loads of um, radioactive particles and was charged, certainly if it was um, a dielectric material, the charge really would be homogeneously distributed inside. Let's say we've got an, an overall is shooting out beta particles and I've got a positive charge. Well, the positive charges inside the ball are going to try and all get as far away from each other as possible by repulsion. So they will naturally tend to form a, a homogeneous distribution inside. It doesn't have to be homogeneous, but again, it's almost... Um, to completely trivial to say if I integrate the charge density inside over the volume, I'm going to get the total charge. So now we put that together with the above equation and therefore we have got now that the surface integral of J dot N dA is equal to the volume integral and again I'll first of all write minus d by dt of the volume integral of rho dv. All I've done there is literally take that plugged in the charge enclosed on the right hand side here. And I've mentioned this before and I'm not sure of any a priori justification for this but it always works that you can take the time derivative inside or outside the spatial integral so this can, we can also write as minus the integral of d rho by dt over the volume. And again, all that, all that we've done, you know, say this is uh, to emphasise that the concept is, ve is basically very simple. All we've done is say that the current flowing out of a ball is equal to the rate of change of charge inside the ball must be so if charge is conserved. But now, of course, we've got Gauss's theorem. So we know that that's, and, and again, that, that this is absolute, oops, just taken off. This is absolutely uh, generally true theorem of any vector field. And here it's written as the vector field C because it's true of any vector field. Well, of course, if it's true of any vector field, this is a vector field, the current density. So it's true of this cu current density. So I can replace this by pure mathematics as the volume integral of the divergence of the um, current density. So by Gauss's theorem, and this is Gauss's theorem of pure maths. I have got, and again to stress there's absolutely no physics in this equation, that the surface integral of the normal component of any vector field is equal to the volume integral of the divergence of the same, I don't really need brackets here, I think that's fairly obvious, of the divergence of the field. So we can now replace the left-hand side of this equation precisely 
by the volume integral of the divergence. And I haven't given this an equation number precisely because there's no physics in it. That's pure maths. That has to be true just by virtue of the fact that the current density is a vector field. So therefore, I can say that the volume integral of the divergence of the, of the current density is equal to the volume integral. Oops, excuse me. Somebody should have shouted at me there, the volume integral of the negative rate of change of the current density. Well now, again, we've used this argument so many times in the course, if this volume integral is equal to this volume integral over any arbitrary volume in space, the integrands must be equal to each other. And we have now discovered a really massive result. Therefore, del dot j is equal to minus d rho by dt. And we sure are going to give this an equation number. And this is now the differential or uh, equation for uh, conservation of charge, or what's called local conservation of charge for local people. So there might be a few people left who still watch League of Gentlemen. <laughs> this is local charge conservation. And, uh, and that's a much more powerful principle than just charge conservation. So equation 9-7 is the differential. Remember, this is a differential equation, true at every point in space in the universe. This is the differential equation for conservation of charge and called the principle of local charge conservation. So we've re-expressed charge conservation as a differential equation now. So this is a entirely more powerful concept. Like, the charge of the universe would be entirely conserved. Let's say, go back to my, I've got my coulomb of charge here. If it suddenly, this just disappeared, it popped away, and up in Alpha Centauri, a coulomb of charge appeared. That conserves the charge of the universe. That's charge conservation. But this is more powerful. It says that charge has got to flow from here to Alpha Centauri to preserve charge conservation. And as we'll see, it will only be able to flow at less than the speed of light. This is particularly a local principle. And this is illustrated. This isn't on the course handout. But exactly this is what's being illustrated here, that process A in which some charge just simply disappears from um, one place and pops up somewhere else. So, at, uh, you know, time one here, I've got a charge over here, or just I've got some bunch of charge here, and it pops up over here. That, 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 that's still charge conservation. However, charge can only flow from one place to another according to equation 9-7. So there has to be, again, uh, of course, this was copied from something which uh, didn't have vector signs. That's, that, that's a vector current density. That this is a, a very different principle is saying, well, not different, but a more sophisticated principle. Not only is charge conserved, but this kind of process is ruled out because that doesn't contravene local charge conservation. The divergence of the current density vector in, in, in A is not equal to minus d rho by dt in this area. The whole charge just disappears. It doesn't flow through any surface. It just pops up somewhere else. But in this process, for charge to get from here to here, it's got to flow from one place to another. So this is a principle of local charge conservation. And that is, again, quite a massive step forward. And this is now brings us back to the Maxwell equations, is that 
What Maxwell realized, and this was the, the great leap forward in a sense in the calculation, is that he realized that equation four, the fourth of the, Ampere's law could not be correct. And the way he realized that it's not correct is he took the divergence of equation four. So the divergence of the left-hand side is the divergence of a curl. And we've proved that the divergence of a curl is always zero. And again, I, uh, I, 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 I mentioned that when we get into the um, uh, unification theory, which we're really starting on now, because we're de deriving the, the new term in the Ampere-Maxwell law, uh, this is something I sent out. It's not a mysterious property. All you've got to do is write out the x, the y, the z components of the curl, take d by dx of the x component, add d by dy of the y component, add d by dz of the z component, and I've got the divergence of the curl. There are only six terms, and by Euler's relation, that cancels that, that cancels that, that cancels that. There's no magic here. The divergence of a curl is always zero. So the divergence of the left-hand side of Ampere's law is emphatically always zero. But the di of course, uh, the divergence of mu naught j is mu naught times the divergence of j. This is a fundamental constant. It's a scalar. I can take it outside of the divergence operation. <laughs> So we've now got that zero on this side of the equation, but on the other side, we've got a non-zero fundamental constant times what we now know by equation 9-7, the divergence of the current density is minus d rho by dt. So what we've got in this equation is, a no it cannot make sense physically, because as soon as I make this, I now know that this side is, that I can replace this by minus d rho by dt. This side is always zero, yeah? But of course that's not always zero. That's saying that charge density must always remain constant. Well, that's obviously nonsense. Again, my radioactive tennis ball shooting out its, its alpha particles is becoming more and more negative. Obviously, rho inside this ball is a function of time. d rho by dt is non-zero for this very simple process. Or indeed, going back to figure 43, at the moment, if, I, if you go across the lecture theatre, what's rho as a function of x? Zero, zero, so we'll assume it's zero in the air. Zero, zero, zero goes up to some finite value, comes down and goes on. I move the ball across, and now the distribution goes zero where it was previously non-zero, and here I've got some charge. d rho by dt can be non-zero for any kind of simple process, just moving some charge around. So we've got an equation whose left-hand side is always zero, and whose right-hand side is non-zero as soon as charge begins to move. In other words, this equation contravenes the law of conservation of charge. So this is the, the, the crucial step forward. So let's do that. The, uh, so again, move these ones out of the way. So uh, Maxwell realised... ..that the... Um, uh, let's just call it at the moment, yes, the Ampere's law contravenes charge conservation. And you'll see again, this is why now the differential equations become so important. If you just have an integral law that says, oh, I've got a current and magnetic field lines go around it, that looks like a perfectly good law of physics. But when it's re-expressed in this way and we express the charge conservation as a differential equation, it now, I won't say becomes obvious, but we can prove very quickly that it, there's a contravention here. And th this is exactly what Maxwell did. He took the divergence of Ampere's law.
And obviously, if an equation is true, taking its divergence had better be true too. So the divergence of the left-hand side is del dot curl B, and the divergence of the right-hand side, trivially taking the constant to the outside, is the divergence of the current density. So the left-hand side is always zero. So we proved this in lecture five, and I pop the view graph up again. The divergence of a curl is zero, full stop. But the right-hand side is now mu naught. I'll put take the minus sign out there, d rho by dt. So naught is equal to minus mu naught d rho by dt, which is just obviously not true. So there was something fundamentally wrong with Ampere's law. Well, Maxwell, as you probably are gathering by now, was quite a clever bloke. And he wasn't content with showing that Ampere's law was wrong. He was interested in how we put it right. How do we rephrase Ampere's law in order to... The, again, this is, a, this is a calculation from his raw notes that it just all came pretty much in, in one day. You know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll leave him to a well-earned bowl of porridge by the end of this lecture, but uh, this is kind of like uh, in the morning. So Maxwell proposed adding a new term to the right-hand side of Ampere's law. He saw the answer immediately. We'll prove why it's right in a moment. So uh, he took that the curl of the magnetic field is equal to mu naught j. Ampere's law's obviously got a lot of true physics in it. Now, it's got all the, all the physics of steady currents are in Ampere's law. It's right in certain circumstances. He proposed adding the new term mu naught epsilon naught dE by dt. And as a result of it having been... Um, a modification of Ampere's law made by Maxwell, equation 9-8 is known as the Ampere-Maxwell law. Excuse me. The Ampere-Maxwell law. Just for the sake of convenience now, and I, I, I'll use this a bit... Um, next week as well, I'm going to divide the whole equation through by mu naught. Obviously, mu naught is a non-zero fundamental constant. I can divide the... It's just for cosmetics, so that it, I think it makes the proof clearer. Um, or we can write it as... I won't write this as a separate equation number, because it's, it's trivial to divide this side by mu naught. And then I get just the plane current density here plus epsilon naught dE by dt. And one of the things I'll, I'll come... Again, this is more for future reference, but uh, we're going to study the Maxwell-Ampere law in more detail uh, on Monday. The term... You'll see this written a lot in books. Epsilon naught dE by dt is called the displacement current density. Again, one of these things in physics, that really misleads people. I want to emphasise right from the outset, this is not a current density epsilon naught dE by dt. It's a fundamental constant multiplied by the rate of change of the electric field. 
there is no actual current passing through space. An electric field is changing as a function of time, and that's it. However, in the Ampere-Maxwell law, this term seems to take the role of a current density. In, in certain circumstances, it displaces the current density in the equation, and it's called the displacement current density. It's not a current density. It just has the same units as current density and the same effect. So that, we'll come back to that again. But the crucial thing now is, it's OK, let's take the divergence. of equation 9-8. We saw that the problem with uh, the Ampere law was that taking the divergence of Ampere's law seemed to give us something nonsensical. So we get 1 over mu naught del dot del cross B on the left-hand side is equal to del dot J yeah, plus... And again, I can take the space and time derivatives as I like. I'm taking the divergence of dE by dt is the same as d by dt of the divergence of E. Again, I'm assuming I can take the space-time derivatives in either order. So I get plus epsilon naught times, uh, <coughs> excuse me, d by dt of del cross E. That's the divergence. Well, this side's still zero. Zero divided by a fundamental non-zero constant is zero. And we've just done this. This is where the whole problem came. We know that this is minus d rho by dt. But now we, we, we can invoke Maxwell's first law. By Maxwell's first equation... we have got that del dot... Remember, this, this is always true. It happened when the curl of E was also zero to give us the correct law of electrostatics, Gauss's flux law of electrostatics. So we can say that now we can replace del dot E by rho over epsilon naught. So, let's move this up, up a bit. So zero, on the left-hand side, we know is minus d rho by dt. That's the divergence of the current density. And then plus epsilon naught times d by dt, replacing the divergence of the electric field with rho over epsilon naught. It works. Of course it works. It's one of the fundamental equations of physics. So now we have got an equation that the left-hand side is always zero. This term is minus d rho by dt, and this term is epsilon naught times d by dt of rho over epsilon naught. Well, epsilon naught is just a fundamental scalar constant. It cancels out. And so the divergence of the right-hand side of the Ampere-Maxwell law is always zero. So we've now discovered, by, and Maxwell discovered by this purely theoretical reasoning, that the Ampere law had to be corrected in this way. And we've now got a completely new equation of physics. And it's kind of satisfying too. Because when we did F Faraday's law... Well, we get that the, a, a dynamic magnetic field, a dB by dt, is producing a curl of the electric field. And now we can see that a dynamic electric field, a dE by dt, is producing a curl of the magnetic field. So there's a, a now a much more beautiful symmetry to the whole set of equations. And so... You know, we can summarise, I'm obviously going to go on with the Maxwell-Ampere law, and it was after the discovery of this term that Maxwell was able to unify electricity, magnetism, and to everyone's amazement, at first including his own, include optics. So if 
we accept Maxwell's first three equations and charge conservation we must accept equation 9-8. Again, even with... Uh, it's nice being in a lecture theatre where I've actually got some blackboards to work with. You know, I don't like that style of view, the, the, the view graphs, but I, so I apologise for using that when I'm over in V45, but you know, it's, it's just too cumbersome over there to, uh, to use blackboards. So... Uh, I think, you know, it's much nicer kind of pace probably for, for you and for me if we, 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 we had all the lectures in here and put in a bid for that, but, you know, didn't get it. So anyway, um, so alternatively, if we accept Maxwell's four equations, then charge is conserved. So this is a very beautiful step forward. And as I said, you know, the reason we accept Maxwell's equations is that you know, they've been around for over a century and nobody, I mean, 150, more than 150 years, nobody has found any um, uh, exceptions to it. So... Um, we now have this you know, rather beautiful set of new equations. Let me just get these out of the way and I'd like to... There's one or two, and we've got ten minutes now, and there's one or two things that I'd like to do to set things up for next week. First of all, I'd like to say this new term here, there's nothing... It's not just to do with the speed of light. I'm, I'm going to go through two big examples uh, on Monday where, uh, and really humble ones, in a sense, we're just going to do a charging and a discharging capacitor, and I'm going to show that it's necessary to have this new term just to calculate the correct magnetic field near a capacitor that's charging and discharging. You know, very humble, low-level physics problem. I've got some charge flowing onto a capacitor plate, and I'm going to prove that without this new term, we couldn't get the right answer, experimentally correct answer for the magnetic field. I'm also going to go back to my radioactive tennis ball and prove that I can only get the right answer for the magnetic field with this new term. And in particular, you might think, think this out, there's a topological sort of problem here. If I've got... Like we always think, if I've got current flowing in a wire, the magnetic field we know goes in loops around the wire. But if I've got a spherical current, well, is the magnetic field circulating that way? Seems to be particle. Is it, should it be circulating that way? Should it be circulating that way? You know, I think, well, that topologically, in a spherical symmetry, what can the magnetic field circulate around? And the answer, you'd be right in, if you think it through, is that it can't. There is no magnetic field. There's a current density, but there's no magnetic field when you have a, a spherical ball of current. And in those circumstances, this term and this term will exactly cancel and give us a magnetic field with no curl. So it, this new term, it's not just about all the speed of light calculation, which we'll come to next Wednesday. It is utterly necessary in two very simple circumstances, charging up a capacitor and looking at a spherical current density. So that's the first thing that I'd like to say. The second thing, of course, we've now, we've got there. We have got the full set of equations. This one isn't right, this circled equation. We've got to have plus mu naught epsilon naught dE by dt to maintain charge conservation. As I say, now we've got much more symmetry that this, this dynamic magnetic field's producing a curl in the electric field and this dynamic electric field's producing a curl in this field. Now, I'll be talking next week about what's called Maxwell's equations in free space. 
And if the view graph has not kind of escaped me, uh, this is a very special approximation. So you do need, you see, we, we're going to move next week to almost the opposite set of approximations to what we started with. Remember, we started off with a, uh, a, a, a in electrostatics, with a, a row over epsilon naught here, and we started off here with a mu naught j, and we've seen we've had to add this term. Now, you do need charge to, to, to start an electric field going. You do need a current density to start a magnetic field going. But let's say we've done that. And we now move a long distance away from the sources, the sources of, of charges and currents. In other words, we take the approximation. We're so far away from any current density, maybe you know, halfway between here and Alpha Centauri, there aren't really many. Uh, there's not much matter. There's not much charge matter. Very good approximation. And indeed, light does get to us from Alpha Centauri, even though there's no matter in between. This is the point of the calculation. And Maxwell's equations in free space are emphatically not the full set of equations. We drop this term, and then in this we know we've got a plus mu naught j, and we drop this term. And Maxwell's equations in free space are specifically these four equations, and that's what we'll be studying um, in the, uh, the, the, the crucial lecture next week. These, and just to emphasise, there are no charges, there are no currents. They've all, we, we, we could be light years away from the nearest charge and current, and they have a negligible effect. But this certainly does not say that nothing's happening. This, there's a non-zero curl which to both fields, and so the, the, the electric and magnetic fields dynamically couple with each other, even in the absence of the sources that created them in the first place. So as you move away, uh, the whole point of the calculation will be to show again, which is not obvious looking at them, we'll have to do the maths, when you combine this set of four equations, you get a dynamic <laughs> equation, which is a wave equation. So, that's the last piece that I want to do for preparation, is to talk a little bit about where, and again, I'm going to, because it's, you know, it would be terribly disappointing if having got to, you know, the, if you like, the vital point, and I say, and, and now we've got a, a, a three-dimensional wave equation, hey, you know, isn't this beautiful, if you don't recognise a wave equation. So I just want to do, uh, I know uh, it's a long time, you've studied this kind of thing, but it's a long time since you did uh, vibrations and waves. So, hang on, let me just, uh, I've got to find two other view graphs here, usual, usual problem, um, is just to say, first of all, that this is a one-dimensional wave equation. If you have d2 by dx squared of anything, and it's equal to 1 over c squared d2 by d anything squared uh, by d2 by dt squared, that is necessarily is a wave. And so that's the point that I want to get to. And let me just go back. Again, I say you don't need notes on this. this I'll, I'll email uh, this, this out to you because uh, if you don't recognise a wave equation when we derive it, it would be a, a real shame. So... One, and I'm not saying this is, this is a possible solution of a wave equation, is that the wave is some fixed function of x minus ct. And I let u equal x minus ct. This is a single variable u. In other words, we get a pattern in space which is moving towards positive x. And that is straightforward to prove by a very simple application of the chain rule that any such function must be a solution of the wave equation. Let's, as I say, let u equal x minus ct. Yeah? And uh, our wave equation is d2 psi by dx squared is 1 over c squared d2 psi by dt squared. And I now say, well, let's let psi be this function of u. 
Well, it's, it's simple chain rule differentiation. D psi by dx is, is now df by du written as a straight back derivative because this is a single variable u, du by dx. And because df by du, I mean, <laughs> that's trivial, is u, du by dx is equal to 1, yeah? If I differentiate this equation, du by dx is equal to 1, so that's equal to 1, so d psi by dx is just df by du because du by dx is 1. Well, obviously, if I differentiate uh, this thing twice, I've got the same thing. So d2 psi by dx squared is just d2f by du squared because every time I differentiate uh, du by dx, I just get 1. However, when I differentiate... Uh, du by dt, that's equal to minus c. Yeah? If I differentiate u with respect to time, I just get minus c. And if I differentiate it twice with respect to time, I bring this factor down twice. So again, simple chain rule, d psi by dt is df by du, du by dt. The du by dt is obviously minus c. And so this is equal to minus CDF by DU. So if I do the differentiation twice, I bring down another minus C, and I get this. So D2 Psi by DT squared is plus C squared D2F by DU. D2 Psi by DX squared is D2F by DU squared. So in other words, again, I can take across here, this is 1 over C squared times this. So any... Anything, absolutely anything, that obeys such a wave equation, such an equation, if D2 by, for example, as a, an electric field component, is 1 over C squared times D2 by the same electric field component, then that is a wave of electricity. And that's precisely uh, where we'll get to. And again, uh, it's slightly leaping ahead in the course handout, just to remind you what's going on there is that think of a function that's at first centred on the origin at time t is naught. And it doesn't, you know, you, when we first learn waves, it's kind of, oh, everything's perfectly sinusoidal. Well, if you keep shaking the source perfectly sinusoidally, it will keep shake, shaking out si perfectly sinusoidal waves. But if you flip the source a bit and go ba-boom, ba-boom, the wave will spread out even when you stopped any motion at the source. You know, if I've got a string here and I give it a flick and there's a string and there's tension in it, it goes all the way to that wall, I don't have to keep flicking and flicking and flicking and flicking. Once I've given a flick, you know, the, 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 the wave will, 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 will keep tr going across. And that's exactly what's being represented here, is if this is some snapshot at the origin, well, some uh, distance... Remember, this is distance here. This is, sorry, C times T. Then the whole pattern has moved away from the origin. The pattern hasn't changed. It's an identical pattern. It's just moved away from the origin. And this is a wave propagating in positive X direction with velocity C. So um, uh, that's, that, that's the aim, is I'm going to... First of all, do the Ampere-Maxwell law to explain that this term is not just to do with the speed of light, and then we're going to derive a wave equation from the free space. So, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are. <laughs> okay, have a nice weekend, and enjoy your Faraday's law problems.